Hey everyone, Tim here uh, with a video I promised to make for you uh, where I was going to do some review of uh, Chapter 2 homework problems. Um, and this video will be fairly short, uh, which I um, kind of was saying I'm, I was just going to record a short video, but it's going to be uh, even shorter than I thought it would because almost nobody replied to my request for you to make requests about what problems you'd like to hear me talk about and explain a little bit further or other questions that you had. But I, I do have um, a couple questions here. Um, let me pull up um, the discussion board. Whoa, that's not what we want. That's not what we want either. Oof, sorry. I thought I had this up. I didn't. I was just looking at it on my phone, I guess. Uh, so discussion thread for chapter two. Um, and by the way, so I, I said in the weekend update email to let me know by Sunday about questions you wanted me to cover for this video. And then I also um, made one for Tuesday for the chapter three homework. And then I think, uh, what did I say for chapter five homework? Maybe Saturday, something like that, or Friday? Um, later on this week, but I'm going to do more of these um, as just like another way to try to get some feedback and and more conversation space for this online version of the class because um, this is this is a big part of the on campus class that I think is is very useful for students and and um, helps you learn so uh, to be able to ask questions and hear answers that kind of rapport so I'm I'm going to do, keep doing these as a way to create that space uh, but I'll need to um, Keep them. I want to keep them on schedule for the most part as much as I can, and that means hearing from you in a timely fashion about this. So I'll, I'll keep up this protocol of telling you when uh, is sort of the deadline of when I want to record the video, so I'll need requests in by that time. So um, I only got a couple uh, replies here. So um, let's do, let's, let's knock them out. So first off, um, Valentina was asking about this um, problem from exercise nine does the dog need to go for a WLK and is asking um, to have all five questions answered um, the way it's going to be on the exam which I think is very prudent to ask so here is the problem does the dog need to go for WALK we're going to do the full linguistic analysis treatment here and I'm actually going to type it up in front of you too so you don't just hear me um, with the voice here but let's say uh, okay here's the on the exam it'll be underlined um, does the dog need to go for a W A L K so this is what it might look like um, when you get it on on the exam online on canvas in utterance the portion that I'm asking you to analyze will be underlined Sometimes there'll be a couple people talking and only one person's utterance will be underlined. The rest of it's just there for context. In this case, there isn't that happening. There's just this one utterance to understand. Um, and then I'm asking these five questions and you'll give your answers just like this. So the first question is, what is the literal meaning? And I would recommend writing literal meaning colon and then here it is. And remember uh, the answers for uh, what's the literal meaning and the implied meaning are going to take the form of like utterances like so imagine things in quotations and here with the literal meaning I need to sort of re-articulate what was said but in a way that only draws attention to the dictionary definitions and the basic grammar rules and that kind of thing so I'd probably put here something like um, uh, does the canine require ambulatory activity or ambulatory exercise how about that <laughs> something like that when we just look at this um, in terms of what we get from the, the semantic and syntactic conventions of English um, this is something in this ballpark park I think would be ideal then I'm asking for what is the speech act so you should say speech act colon what it is and what are they doing they are asking a question. We have four basic options here uh, for what we do with language. Um, making statements, making claims, stating, claiming, 
um, asking questions, giving commands, and expressing emotions. And then there's some other like more exotic things or more esoteric things that sometimes we're doing like uh, we've talked about before. Um, so uh, here, I don't think there's anything more exciting happening on the level of the speech act. By painting this picture with their words, all they're doing is really just asking a question. And so I would say in this case, nothing more to add. Um, then we're asking about the implied meaning. And this one's a little tricky. Um, so we're kind of going to kill somewhat of two birds with one stone because Brett had a question um, about how I, I mentioned in a, in a previous lecture that um, there is this like tricky problem that's on the exam where many students have a intuition about what the implied meaning is, but it's not the full implied meaning. And a great way that you can double check your answers about the implied meaning, or if you're just getting stuck about like, I don't know, that little intuitive voice in my hand is like, I got nothing, something like that. Then you can you can always start doing the first stage of the answer to question five, the how the implication is generated stuff. Um, so I was talking about that in the lecture, and, and Brett was curious about some examples of that thing happening. This one might be like that, actually. So... Um, I've had some students when we've done homework review on this say uh, it the implied meaning is just does the dog need to go for a walk like I don't, I don't see what else is going on here um, I do think that the implied meaning does have this aspect to it does the dog need to go for a walk or the does the canine require ambulatory exercise I mean there's just that meaning going on but there's something most more more than that. So sometimes implied meanings are not a radical distortion. Sometimes it's just adding something on top of that. Um, but this is part of the meaning of what they're asking um, when they say, "Does the dog need to go for W A L K?" They're asking, "Does the dog need to go for a walk?" And something else. And don't use the word walk when you give your answer. This is what I think is is kind of like the full implied meaning here. Um, and why is that? Well, we'll, we'll get into that um, in how the implication is generated. But if that had been, if you had been like, oh, I'm not sure, there feels like there should be something more to this, then you might have jumped on to to doing, um, for, let me just get this down really quick. You might have jumped to question five here about how the implication is generated to get a sense for this, of what, what might, what more might there be to capture? So um, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here, too, to kind of help connect the dots on this. Um, so let's say you just had the, you, you're like trying to answer the implied meaning, and you just have, does the dog need to go for a walk? And you're like, oh, that doesn't feel like there, there's got to be something more going on. Why would Tim give a problem like this on the exam? That is just so straightforward. Because um, I, I, maybe I mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. I, am, I do not design exams to have trick problems. You do not have to worry about this from me. I'm going to give you problems that are tricky, that are like, you know, challenging, but I'm not going to try to do cheap stuff like, like groaner jokes or something. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be looking to fool you or have some weird little loophole or something like that. They'll be tough, but they'll be tough in a straightforward way. So you might be thinking, like, is Tim just really giving me something? There's got to be something more going on here, something a little more robust. And you'd be right. I'm not going to give you some just silly layup just to give you a silly layup or to, like, try to psych you out or something. So the way that you can double-check your an uh, answer is to go through that checklist of things that I was talking about in the lecture videos before about how to explain conversational implication. The, again, the checklist is what Gracie Maxim is being violated, Second thing is, uh, how does the implied meaning solve that Gricean violation? And then three, uh, why choose that implied meaning as the solution um, to the Gricean violation? Why not something else that would also fit the bill there? Why this particular implied meaning? And so you basically have to get into the background assumptions about how you're conceptually connecting the dots between the literal meaning and the implied meaning. And I'm going to walk you through all that with this one, too. But that first step is the real key one. Which Gricean maxim is being violated? According to Paul Grice's theory of implication, the thing that stimulates us to go 
reading into things more in depth um, to looking for subtext or something like that to go trying to find an implied meaning is just that is is triggered by these weirdnesses of the expectations of the Gricean maxims being uh, foiled or um, or violated. So uh, here, what's weird about the original utterance, the literal meaning, um, has to do with how they spell out the word walk. And this is a Gricean maxim violation of manner on the grounds of brevity. So spelling out words is just fine. You can T-E-L-L -L what I am, S-A-Y-I-N-G, when I spell my words. Um, but it's a really inefficient way to communicate the, those semantic meanings, right? So um, it, it's not like you're going to get confused. B-U-T is a lot, there's a lot slower way than saying but. I, I kind of screwed up that sentence, sorry. I was trying to do something clever there, but I think you get the meaning, right? Um, to spell out words doesn't create any confusion or a lack of clarity. It's just involving more language uh, it's less efficient in terms of the words it's not a quantity issue because quantity is about information and for me to spell out a word or for me to just say the word both has the same amount of information it's just the way I'm packaging up the manner in which I'm presenting that information so this is a manner violation so whatever's got to be the implied meaning has to be able to make sense of that it's got to be able to resolve what's so weird about that if you had as the implied meaning just does the dog need to go for a walk as like that's what they're communicating we still have that hanging stimulus right of like well wait well, so what why did they spell out the word then right if that's just the implied meaning that doesn't explain that so that's the technique that i was referring to brett and for anyone else who's curious in the lecture before is how if i'm if there's something left over in the implication for me to catch I can sort of see whether my reading of the implied meaning has exhausted everything that was weird. Uh, it's like made complete sense out of what didn't make sense with that Gricean maxim violation. If there's still some weirdness left over, then that means there's more implication to figure out. Um, and here, there is. So that's why I added on this part, and don't use the word walk when you give your answer. If this is also a part of the meaning, now there's a motivation or a reason or a purpose, which is what we're going to get into here at the Conversational Act. There's a purpose for spelling out the words, um, for why something is going to, what appeared to be less efficient is actually more efficient, as I say in, I think, my uh, homework answers here. So um, that's that's how I might try that technique. Uh, I, there might be an immediate meeting that I get, and I'm like, does that cover it? Maybe yes. And so it's like, okay, cool. That fully resolves all the weirdness of the, the maxim violation. But if there is still those hanging threads about, like, why did they do it that way? This seems like a weird way to speak. Or there's a, a Gricean maxim that hasn't been resolved yet. Um, then there's got to be some more implication going on here. So you might want to go back and rethink if there's something more to add. Um, so there is a problem on the exam that's like this, and uh, some students, I think, pick up on it right away, but I was just saying, in my experience, many students have incomplete, um, uh, an incomplete analysis of the implication here, so uh, maybe uh, good to have that technique in your back pocket in case you find yourself in that situation, or just to double check your implied meaning answers to make sure you, you've got everything, right, that there isn't some extra weirdness to explain. Okay, so going into the conversational act, once we've got the implied meaning, we can figure out what the conversational act is. Just like after we had the literal meaning, we can figure out what the speech act is. Um, but the, there is a sense in which the implied meaning and conversational act get wrapped up in each other. Because the conversational act is also not just what the speaker is doing at the level of implication, but it's also getting into these questions about intentions, motives, goals, purposes, etc. So here, just going off of the implied meanings message, if they had just been explicit about it all, they are, again, still asking a question, but they're also giving a command. 
um, they're, they're giving a command about how to answer that question. I'll just put that in there. And then we might want to talk about what purposes they have. And their purpose is to get an answer to the question without um, unnecessarily getting the dog excited. Now this is starting to read into a lot more and into the situation um, for sure. Um, and I'll get into why I'm putting this extra meaning in here and we explain how the implication is generated. But I definitely think that this is a part of the meaning. Um, we need to assign some purpose to what the speaker is up to that makes this inefficient way of speaking actually count as efficient. That's a way in which we kind of tie off the loose hanging thread of the maxim violation. Remember again, violations spur implied meaning uh, speculation about implied meanings, according to Paul Grice, because they're weird. It's like the person is operating irrationally. They're talking or contributing to the conversation in a way that seems to be, um, seems to be, uh, un, not, I shouldn't say unnatural, but uh, seems to be irrational to the cooperative purpose of the conversation. So if something appears to be weird, our implication should be able to make sense of that in the sense of where it, we're basically exerting, like I talked about in the lecture, charity. It's like, how does the speaker actually, once I'm looking at it more deeply, acting perfectly rational, even if on a superficial level of just the literal meaning, it appears to be irrational. Okay, so we're going to uh, pull all these threads together in our explanation of how the implication is generated. This is going to be a longer paragraph, and we've got these three things to mark off on our checklist. So I'm going to start with the first item in the story about the Gricean maxim that's being violated. So I will say um, the Gricean maxim of manner is being violated on the grounds of the expectation that a speaker be brief when communicating and spelling out words takes longer and is less efficient than just saying the word directly. So when you're identifying Gricean maxims that are violated, it is good to explain what particular rule. So you noticed um, I talked specifically about the rule. I mentioned the rule to be brief. Um, in fact, I might even put that in a little quotation here. Because if you remember, we've got quantity, quality, relevance, and manner, but there's some kind of like sub rules for those. Like for quality, it's don't lie, don't say things that you believe to be false, and don't say things for which you lack adequate evidence. Um, for quantity, it's don't give more information than is required, but also don't give too little information. For relevance, I have those two suggestions that I added on to the book of like changing the subject, saying things out of the blue. I mean, it's good to put into your answer here exactly which of the what particular rule under those maxims um, is that the situation is having trouble with. Okay, so we got that down. The implied meaning which includes, I should put that, how do I do this? Which includes the command to avoid the use of the word walk is actually, is, oh no, I, I should put this, is able to make sense of this because it assigns a purpose or reason for why we would avoid saying walk directly. And so now I'm getting into the specifics of the content, okay? Um, and that's kind of important here for being able to see how it's more efficient. Um, and this is where I get into my background assumptions. So if you don't know, if you don't have a lot of background assumptions about dogs, this could be 
a little trickier. In fact, you might have not even known what to do with this one at all. This is a good opportunity for me to say that on the exam, I've tried really hard to make sure we don't have uh, exam problems that work like this. That if you just lack some of the background knowledge, maybe it's specialized knowledge, then you aren't, aren't going to be able to figure out the problem. Um, it's very hard to do this in a completely foolproof way that works for every possible student who could ever take my class. Um, but this is why I was saying before, uh, if you think you're missing some background knowledge that's important, call me up in the middle of the exam and let's talk about it. Um, and I can at least tell you, yeah, you've got what you need or you don't, uh, here's some information that's helpful. So don't be shy about uh, asking me about that. But I, I feel pretty good. This exam's been through the gauntlet <laughs> of uh, being tested by many students. So I think it, I think it's good, but I can always, there can always be something new that happens that I haven't anticipated. Okay, so uh, I know, or maybe I could even be more specific in my answer here. Um, I hold background assumptions that tell me dogs have some limited linguistic abilities, which include the understanding of some simple words like walk. Also, I know that dog that many dogs get excited about the prospect of going on a walk. And that an excited dog Whoa, not an excited god. An excited dog that can't go for a walk is a bit of a pain to deal with. So, if in this situation, so if in this situation the answer to the question is no, then the speaker presumably would want to avoid getting the dog excited for nothing. Okay? Avoiding the word walk in asking the question um, in order to prevent this tragedy <laughs> I'm just making this up right now uh, avoiding the word walk and asking the question in order to prevent this tragedy implies that the person answering the question should likewise uh, avoid the use of that word or there would be no point for the speaker to avoid it. All, right. All it would take is one person saying, oops, saying walk in earshot of the dog to trigger their excitement. Okay, so this might have looked like way, way more, and, and admittedly, I'm, I'm trying to give a very thorough answer here. I want you to give you a, a really good paradigmatic example of a full credit answer. This is maybe, there, there's definitely some ways to make this more efficient. Like I said, I, I just went into this video, which I wanted to record it and just do it. I didn't have this all prepared ahead of time, um, other than I'm just a little familiar thinking about this problem. Um, but this checks all the boxes, right? It, ta it talks about the Gricean maxim that's being violated and explains why it's violating that maxim or that particular rule. It talks about how the implied meaning solves that problem, and it brings up the background assumptions of how you get from what was said literally to uh, this implied meaning. So that's, that's an example I would give you. Um, so like I, I mentioned, answering this or doing this sort of demonstration did address both of the two 
uh, questions that I had here um, from the discussion thread. Um, but I actually wanted to help uh, with Brett's question. Just I want to give one more illustration of it, and I can do that. Um, so let's do um, which one did I want to do? Oh, I just thought of this. Uh, shoot, there was one I was just looking at. Uh, let me pause the video for a second and try to recover my thoughts. I had one picked out. Oh, that's right. It just uh, it slipped my mind uh, just for a second. Okay, I wanted to talk about this one. These sweet potatoes are very filling. Um, so I had a student once, um, or I've had probably a couple students do this, but there's one that jumps out to my mind here, where they gave the answer um, that the implied meaning is the person saying, I'm full. Okay. Um, now that's true. I think I think that's that is an implied meaning that's present here. Um, but it's not enough. All right. So let's think about what is the the literal meaning and the implied meaning, and then how the implication is generated. Just a brief sketch to kind of demonstrate this. So the literal meaning is something like these sweet sweet potatoes um, that you that are in front of us both presumably uh, have the causal power of making a person um, satisfied with their consumption of them in a small amount. Something like this, right? I'm trying to make this as awkward as possible to just draw attention to the dictionary definition level of meaning, right, at the linguistic act level. Okay, so you get something like that. The implied meaning is something like, no thank you. Something, I think that's in that category, or just no. Um, I think it also includes something like, I'm full, like, I do not want any more sweet potatoes because I am full. I mean, that might be a full, complete uh, of the implied meaning here. That might be an ideal answer, but really, no is okay. Um, I wouldn't be too picky about that if I was grading it on the exam, but maybe slightly better is um, no, and the reason why I'm rejecting this is because I'm full. Maybe that's fine. So the student put down as the implied meaning, um, I'm full. And I was like, that's not a good answer. That's a That would be an incorrect answer. On the exam, I would not be able to give credit for that. And the reason is that that implied meaning does not solve the Gricean maxim violation here. It, not all by itself. So what's weird about this utterance taken literally, if they're just saying, like, these sweet potatoes have this property, the, the, there's a relevance violation of, like, that doesn't that's not a relevant response to the question. The cook asked, do you want more? The answer is yes, no let me think about it, or I refuse to tell you, although that'd be very strange to have happen in this situation. Um, but those are kind of the basic options, right? It's kind of like the doctor case I brought up before, the patient and the doctor in cancer. Someone asks a, que asks a question, there's only so many ways to relevantly respond to it. Um, and if drawing attention to the power, the causal power of the potatoes is not answering the question if you want more, calling attention to the fact that you are full does not itself answer the question either. The real answer to the question would be like, yes, no, I'm not sure, I'm not going to tell you. It's got to be one of those options. Um, you can imagine someone being like, I'm full, but yeah, I'll have some more, right? Something like that. But when they're using it in this context, it pretty clearly means no, no thank you. And why? Well, I can get into the background assumptions here. Um, but the big part of it is trying to assign some purpose of how this response that originally seems to not be relevant is relevant. And the answer, I'm full, actually doesn't connect all the dots there. There's still something left over. It's still like, well, if they just said that, that would have had a relevance violation going on. So that's another example of what I had in mind, Brett. Um, about how and and the thing that is the danger problem that's coming up on the exam. I think students generally get part of the way toward the implied meaning, but not all the way there. And here, saying I'm full, yeah, I think that's like a part of the implied meaning that you throw in and make sense of what's weird a little bit. But there's still a little bit left over, a little little extra weirdness there to figure out. And it's not until we get the full answer of no as part of the implied meaning that we get all the way there. Okay, so I hope this uh, has been useful to you, uh, all of you who are reviewing 
your chapter two homework. Um, I kind of have a feeling that there are probably some more questions out there and people just didn't tell me about it. So uh, if that's the case, you're always free to contact me as you're getting review put together this week to take the exam, etc. Uh, let me know how I can help. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll sign off here and, and try to get some questions down onto the discussion board for the next video um, for the Chapter 3-4 homework video. So And I'll do another one of these. Okay. All right. Until next time, see you tomorrow.